Tere head kollegid, et mul on hea meele rõõm alustada Eesti lastearstide selsi sessiooniga. Et küsimusele, kui, mis vanuseni on laps-laps, siis vastust on vist raske anda, et tundub tänapäeval, et erinevate probleemide korral on see lapse vanus ka erinev, aga vist praegu on see siiski 19 aastat. Ja kui me vaatame lastearstide nii öelda piiblihti ehk Nelsoni tekstbuki, siis seal on kaks vanust, millel on pühendatud eri, eraldi peadük. Üks on vassündinud ja teine on teismelised. Et täna me otsustasime siis oma sessiooni pühendada teismelistele. Miks küllab see koorub välja meie tänase päeva jooksul? Paljud, mis mäletavad, kas ise veel arstina töötades või siis patsientina nõukogu taekseid noorukite polikliinikuid. Et me ei taha arutada nende üle, vaid vaadata tänasesse päeva. Ja selle idee algataja on meie seltsi ekspresident doktor Kaja Julge, kes on osalenud väga palju antud teemat käsitlevatel Euroopa Pediatria Akadeemia töökoosolekutel. Nii et mul on väga hea meel anda nüüd järg üle Kajale sessiooni alustuseks. Ole hea. Tere õhtupoolikust ka minu poolt. Ma arvan, et meil on ees nüüd neli tihedat tundi. Me teeme nii nagu noorukid teevad, kohe ja kiiresti. Me peame mahutama siia need kümme ettekannet, nii et see saab oleva tempokas. Aga ma arvan, et see on väga oluline. Siin auditoorius on palju neid, kes mäletavad noorukite kabinete. Ma mäletan seda, kui ka ma ise seal ei käinud. Praegu on Euroopas palju riike, kus on veel eraldi noorukite kabinetid. Ma arvan, et me ei pea neid tagasi saama, aga ma arvan, et see on teema, mida peaksid teadma nii pediatrid kui perearstid kui täiskasvanute spetsialistid. Ja me ise ka emade, vanaemade, vanaisa, vanaemad, vanaisad, vana, vanaisad, vana, vanaemad, et tead oma laste, laste, laste kohta. Ja it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Anna Kodiranda from Helsinki. She's taking care of adolescents, she's treating and teaching how to treat them. And she is a head of the division of adolescents of of a children's clinic and she's working at the University of Helsinki. You are welcome. It's a pleasure. Please. Thank you, Dr. Julge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really honored and happy to be here today and speak to you about adolescent medicine. Uh, this is the obligatory slide. Uh, during this presentation, I hope I can assure you that adolescent medicine is important and it's worth knowing about adolescents because they are different from children and adults. And I hope that after this presentation you have my point of view about adolescents and I also hope that I give you some tools to work with your patients that are adolescents, no matter what's your speciality. Well, adolescence is a time of life when a child should uh, grow up to be an adult. Uh, it depends on the society, how old you, what, what's the age range, but I think in Western society, uh, Western world, it is considered to be from 12 to 20 years. But of course, if you go to some uh, African countries, it might be from 9 to 14, and then you should be an adult. Uh, well, the fields in adolescent medicine are, of course, the common illnesses uh, and chronic diseases like diabetes or asthma or maybe a transplant of an organ or something like that. That's the same with children. But then there are some sicknesses, illnesses, diseases that start particularly during adolescence. Uh, for example, mental problems, depression, uh, first signs of schizophrenia, or eating disorders. They are particularly uh, diseases of young people, young girls. 
Uh, sexual health becomes very important, of course. Sexuality is something that's a trait in us, and I think Kai Haldre is going to talk more about that today. Uh, adolescence is also the time when uh, uh, young people start to use alcohol or cigarettes, and sports become more serious, so also stress injuries and sports injuries become important field. And also puberty, although the growth is normal, if it's not as uh, normal or it's in the, not in the same pace as with friends, it can become a big problem. So what happens? What's so special about adolescence? I think it's like, it's something that we've all gone through, of course, we know. And, and mostly it goes very smoothly and nice. But it's a huge metamorphosis, like the worm turns out to be to be a butterfly, or, or the duck becomes a swan, or sometimes a terrible eagle. But anyway, changes radically. And not only physically, hair and boobs and genitals, but also psychologically, thinking and emotionally. People should develop uh, empathy and having responsibility not only from for themselves, but for others as well. So the pace in these can be average, but then even if the child, the adolescent is healthy, it can become a problem if the pace is not average. This is an old picture uh, of a textbook. It says 13-year-old girls, 13-year-old boys. This could actually be 12-year-old girls and 15-year-old boys. So the physical pace where you grow can be very different, and that alone can make problems. We know that girls that are early in puberty tend to be more prone to be sexually harassed. Uh, there is a theory that they also develop or, or fall into anorexia easily. They can be mobbed, hey, you're fat look at your boobs, if they look different from their friends. And then on the other hand, boys who are very late, he could be 15, they are known to be mobbed more, they don't do well in sports. The boy who is at 13 years looks like a man already, he's the king. He is very good in sports. But a 15-year-old boy can end up not wanting to go to school because he's mobbed there. He doesn't want to go to gymnastics to, to play sports. He doesn't want to take his clothes off. He can stay home. He can have stomach ache. He's not going to school for two months. And that's dangerous. It's not rocket science, but it's dangerous for the well-being of the child, of the future of the child. Although he's healthy, what to do? You have a child that doesn't want to go to school. So there are, this is a very uh, interesting and, and very, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pace where, where you have to grow, otherwise you won't be able to live a good life, what we think. And the purposes of adolescence, they can be divided to different steps theoretically. For example, early adolescence, when the child realizes that he's different from his parents. He has different thoughts, he has different ideas, he has different beliefs. And at that point, there starts the strong peer identification, which means that a child or adolescent needs friends, of course, but it, it is obligatory, they need friends. And they might have early explore, exploratory behaviors, like tasting cigarettes or tasting alcohol. Mid-adolescence, there should be the emotional separation from parents, strong peer group identification, exploratory and risk behavior, smoking cigarettes, drinking too much alcohol, trying out things. And also, also you should, or usually uh, adolescents have sexual interest developing towards other people, boys or girls, or both. And then late adolescence is a stage where you should start to know what you're going to be when you're an adult. You start to know that you want to go to high school and university or be a good plumber or, or something like that, a rock star. 
whatever. And because of this, usually uh, teenage time starts with this thing that the lovely little girl turns out to be a monster, or the lovely little boy turns out to be a boy who doesn't say more than one or two words in a row. Oh, yeah, they forget to go to the bathroom, and then suddenly they want to uh, stay in the shower for hours. The quarrels are because the child tries to make himself separate from his parents. I can remember now two uh, known politicians in Finland whose parents or father has been a bishop, and they're both communists now. I think there's been a real big gap that they are making to their parents when they were adolescents. In mid-adolescence, uh, a teenager usually knows what he or she will like. Is she a heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, or what? And it's, inter and it's uh, very important that they think about these things. And in late adolescence, one should start to have structures of life, thoughts, beliefs, future. So I'm not worried about teenagers that quarrel with parents, that don't, don't come up show up with, to appointments always. I would be more concerned about teenagers that stay at home, don't have friends, don't like to go to school, are just with their parents or with the internet. That's more dangerous to the development to be an adult. Uh, this is just a very good picture, which you probably know. It's from PNAS, uh, from a Gokte uh, uh, paper. And it's the brain development. The bluer it is, the more mature it is, the brain. And of course, since you can see that at the age of 17, there are still green areas, the brain is not adult brain yet at the 17, 18 years of age. So you cannot ask the teenager to behave like an adult. It takes time for the brain to mature. Uh, some words about sexual health and teenagers, adolescents. I know there's a, a, a lecture about this one as well here today. Just three, three slides. These are the sexual rights usually connected with adults. But in my opinion, uh, they are also for adolescents. Family planning. It is their right if they have sex, if they decide to have sex, uh, they, they need to have also contraception. So they need clinics or doctors or places where they can safely buy condoms or uh, contraceptive pills. It's their right. And they, it's their right to take care of their fertility, which means that they need to have safe places, places where they can go and say, I've had uh, sex and I didn't use a condom. I might have a sexually transmitted disease. Please, can I be tested without that my parents know? It's, it's wise and it's uh, taking care of yourself to be concerned about these things. So this is something that adolescents need too. Uh, of course, they need food and love and education to become adults. That's part of sexual health, in a way, too. And every time you have sexual rights, of course, they have to learn the sexual duties as well. You're not allowed to harm anybody. Now, I, at least in Finland, I don't know here, but I have a lot of times somebody raising their hand and say, hey, come on, sex is not for the adolescents, it's for adults. We must just teach them just to keep their pants on and zippers up and not have sex. Well, uh, but it doesn't work that way. You can teach them as much as you want, but they won't listen. It's the nature or biology or whatever you call it. There was a systemic review published 2007 in British Medical Journal which uh, included 16,000 students from the United States, and it studied the impact of uh, sex health education programs, where the message was abstinence only, don't do it. 
and not one of these abstinence-only programs had any impact on the time of first intercourse, number of apartments, amount of uh, unsafe sex or use of condoms. So it has been tested. You can close your eyes and hope that it works, but it has been tested. It doesn't work. On the other hand, same year 2007 in Journal of Adolescent Health, uh, Douglas et al. published a review that uh, reviewed 83 studies that measured the impact of sexual education programs on the sexual behavior for, for young people less than 25 years all around the world. And uh, it works to teach the young people how to, take, how to use condoms, how to prevent unwanted pregnancies, and so on. Two out of three programs had a positive influence. And contrary to what some people might think, sex education does not accelerate or make adolescents start sex earlier. On the contrary, some programs reduce and transfer later the start of sexual intercourse and accelerates the use of contraceptives. So teaching, giving them information, helps them take care of themselves. And if you trust them, most of them take care of themselves even better. Uh, still, some people might think that, well, I don't want my children or my pupils to even think about these things. And if somebody is so stupid that gets a sexually transmitted disease, well, that was his or her own fault. But I think that we are such a small population, such a small country, Finland and Estonia, we don't, we can't afford things like that. We have to take care of all our growing youth. Okay, what are the challenges and difficulties with uh, uh, teenagers or adolescents? One thing is that uh, they want to be, when they, they are growing up and they want to be like, they want to get out of their families, they want to be normal and they want to be like others, like the ones that don't have a sickness or illness. And they definitely do not want to be chronically ill. They, they, the, the, their family is their friends. But are they then normal and are they doing fine? I don't know what it is the situation here, but uh, in Finland, this is a survey on high school teenagers, on all high school teenagers of Finland, 56 or 52,000 people, uh, or 48,000, <laughs> there it says, how many answers. And uh, teenagers don't feel that uh, well. 17% uh, feel that they're uh, overall health is moderate or poor, and 10% feel that they are depressed moderately or badly, and close to 15% see themselves as obese. Uh, according to official statistics, about 10% of adolescents have a diagnosis of a chronic illness, and most of them turn out to be adults. Do chronically ill patients take better care of themselves if they have diabetes or organ transplant or leukemia or anything? According to a research, no. They have more uh, unsafe sex, they smoke more uh, cigarettes, they have more drug use, they use more alcohol. They are not taking care of themselves better than their healthy friends. So challenges with adolescence is that he or she is going over this metamorphosis. And then if you have a child who is chronically ill, there's the thing that he or she is changing emotionally, physically, uh, socially, but plus there is this sickness or illness that he or she has to sort of uh, insert into her or himself to be that he... Um, thinks that it's okay to have this thing, that I'm, I, I have to take care of it. And that's a problem sometimes. 
uh, let's say that you have this uh, 16-year-old girl that had a heart transplant some six years ago, nine, when she was nine years old, and she's always been taking very well care of herself. And now she's in the intensive care unit. She's been out with her friends for a week during the summer, and she has not taken her pills. Why not? What has happened to this nice little girl? She's nearly killing herself. Or the diabetic who has been treating herself very well and learned to, to take insulin by herself or himself, and then suddenly his uh, glucosylated uh, hemoglobin is going up. Of course, there's the um, adolescence that also has hormones that, that have an impact on the glucose levels. But still, what do you do? If you say, why don't you take care of yourself? They don't talk. Here's a tool that I use with every single patient that walks into my room. And I also tell them, that I ask these same questions from every single girl or boy who comes in, then it's easy to ask. I'm not, I haven't made these questions for you or for the patient. And uh, the questions form this heads, heads. It's for us to remember what to ask to, from those patients. I think if you really want to know how the adolescent is doing, with his or her life, with his uh, ideas, with his treating of his disease or illness, you should go through these at least once. Ask, where do you live? With whom do you live? How do you get along with your parents? Do you get along with your parents? Do you have any adult who you can trust? Where do you go to school? What kind of school is it? Do you have friends? Are you lonely? Are you bullied? Do you bully other people? Hobbies? Do you have any hobbies? Do you go home and play with the uh, data machine the whole night? Do you see any friends? Does your family have money for hobbies? And then when I ask about cigarettes, and I ask everybody, my patients are all over 30, so I'll ask everybody. I don't ask, do you smoke? They say, or do you drink alcohol? No. I ask, how much do you smoke? And she might go, how did you know? I smoke. I didn't. I just ask, how much do you smoke? Don't ask questions that they can answer yes or no, because then you get yes or no. If you really want to know, ask them, how much do you drink? And be precise with that too. Uh, with sexuality things, of course, you have to sort of know the patient already, hopefully. Uh, you can't go and ask, do you have sex? They think you're a pervert. It's none of your business, and that's right. I usually go and ask, do you have, are you dating somebody? And if they say yes, I always ask, is it a he or a she? Uh, no predictions that it's a heterosexual child there. It might be something else. And then if they have never been dating anybody, I ask, have you ever had a crush? And if you have a 17-year-old who has never been in love with anybody, uh, there might be a problem somewhere, <laughs> because usually they've had some kind of a crush at that time. And then if they are dating somebody, I might ask, is there a uh, risk that you might have had a STD? We could test it here and that way find out. Uh, suicide, I don't ask, are you thinking of making a suicide? Again, they say no. I usually ask, uh, is something bothering you or making you really mad? Like a 14-year-old boy, if you go and ask, do you have a depression? They're like, what? No. But if you ask, is there something that's bothering you or you're really mad at, then they can tell what's on their heart. And then with the uh, illness, sickness, I never ask, do you remember to take your medicine? I ask, how often do you forget to take your medicine? Because we all forget it. I forgot mine tonight this morning when I left here at 5.30. It's, it's normal. And then they can say that, well, I, I remember it quite often. And I usually then say three times out of seven during the week, well, yes. If it's a hypothyroid patient whose TS, TSH is elevated, it's no use giving more medicine if the uh, adolescent doesn't take it. And of course, it's the same thing with adult patients. I think with adults as well, you should ask questions openly how much, how often, and so on. Okay. 
remember this when you have the boy who doesn't want to go come to school because he or she has stomach ache. Start with this if there's nothing that you have found from the stomach or stools otherwise. This is very important too. I don't know, you are so many, I'm not going to ask what you do, but adolescents have the right to come to the doctor alone. It doesn't mean that the parents are not coming there after that too. But, I mean, the above-mentioned questions. You can't ask a 14-year-old boy, does he smoke if the mother is sitting next to him? Or is he taking the medicine? The mother usually asks answers, oh yes, every day, and you don't get the right answer. And this is also what we do uh, in the adolescent uh, clinic where I, I work, we do, we, we do this with everybody. We say, this is the way we do. The adolescent comes first, and then the parents, and they, there's usually no problem. I remember one boy uh, who said that he won't come alone with his mother. And I've been working there for eight years, I don't know, six years, seven years. Okay. There are some difficulties in counseling. Uh, because adolescent brain is not like the adult brain yet. Their thinking is very concrete, not like beton, but concrete, and their values differ from ours. And this risky behavior, it's not healthy, but it's, it's sort of part of growing up. You want to try new things, and also teenagers live in a moment. If you tell a, a, a diabetic teenager that if you don't take your insulin regularly in, in 10 years you're going to be blind and in 20 years your uh, kidneys are going to say beep and plaques. They're like 20 years, I'm 36, I'm like in debt, I'm already in the grave. It's too long period. They live now. They, they, they think they never die or at, when they are 30 they are very, very old. And also uh, denial is very commonly used. What I mean is Concrete thinking, for example, I didn't take my pills or I didn't take my asthma medicine today and yesterday. I feel fine. I don't need medicine. Versus if you have abstract thinking, you understand that I forgot my pills, my asthma medicine, whatever, but in the long run it will be harmful for me, although I now feel normal. Also, denial is very common, meaning that this is from an old textbook, but it's puts it beautifully. Every time I visit my doctor, she keeps on talking about what's wrong with me. She says that I ought to know everything about my disease so that I can make informed choices, have better control over my disease. I do not want these continuous remindings of what's wrong with me. When she's not reminding me, I can live my life normally and feel normal like others. I remember one girl who was pregnant 16 years, mother was dead, father didn't know, but the child died in her womb and, and she had to uh, deliver the dead fetus at the, I think it was like 29 weeks or so. And when I went up to her and told her that she's going to have a checkup at my, uh, I'm going to meet her a week later and we can discuss this, she said, I'm never going to come to this hospital again. I'm going to walk out the door. I'm going to forget that this happened. Bye-bye. That was her way of coping with it, denial. Values differ. The gray hair guy could be me. Priorities are mortgage, keeping healthy. And the little guy there could be my son. He's taking half an hour in the shower and making his hair. He doesn't even have to put on makeup. And he has the cell phone attached to his head so it doesn't come out. Okay, this is sort of the beef, what I've been trying to now <laughs> convince you. When treating an adolescent, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be a pediatrician, you can be a neurosurgeon, you can be an oncologist. But remember, there's growing independence in need. They need privacy, don't take the parents always with them. Still, they need guidance, permission, understanding. And there are a lot of effect on puberty, on the treatment commitment. The last three slides, uh, I'm going to talk about this new entity that we have in Finland, special competence 
in adolescent health in Finland. There is now a specialization program for special competence in adolescent health, and it's for licensed physicians who have received specialist degree in medicine in Finland and are members of the Finnish Medical Association. Uh, this is a very young thing. It's a baby still. In September 2000, 2000, 2011, uh, we had a group of doctors 2025 from all fields, uh, and we, had, we decided to establish an association for adolescent medicine. And this Finnish Association for Adolescent Medicine was founded in 2012, and the main goal was to establish a program for special competence in adolescent health. Uh, our Facebook pages opened in January two years ago, and the first uh, two-day summit was 2013. This is the picture taken from the summit. We were more, but that's the core gang. Uh, in June 2014, the Finnish Medical Association accepted the program, which I have here, and first eight degrees of special competence were granted last uh, October, November, December. Now we're, I think, 12 already. And this is our secretary, Elina Hermansson. Uh, the program general outline is in the, that slide. It has 16 objectives, and I'm not going to go through them. But there are objectives like an adolescent health specialist is familiar with youth culture and identifies the importance of the cultural background of the adolescent or is familiar with the Finnish education system and is able to successfully support the transition into adulthood and 13 more points. Uh, then there are eight areas that a participant should master at some level. I'm not going to go through them all. But there is like legislation, ethics, the Finnish society structure and service systems, communication skills, sexual health, and so on. Then there is practical training, two years in tasks that mainly include adolescents, theoretical training, 80 hours, which should be in part done somewhere else than Finland, meaning uh, in, in uh, other countries, like this session could have been theoretical training well. And there's no portfolio uh, exam, but a portfolio where you tell where you've been working, how much, and, and then you have 10 cases of your own patients. And if somebody is interested, I have it here in England, uh, in English, the whole thing, and also there's the uh, website where the portfolio can be seen, but that's in Finnish. And if somebody wants really to start this program maybe here, or, or is interested more. Erilna Hermansson, our secretary, is talking in Tallinn. He has an oral presentation about this uh, program. In, I don't know where it is, but it's the EUSUM 2015 Congress in June. Thank you. Oh, I took all my time. <laughs>